Okay. Um, I think you can hear me. So everybody, we want to get started. Um, my name is Angela Ongere. I'll be moderating um, in partnership with Steve Okello, Dr. Steve Okello, among others as necessary. And we'd like to very warmly and cordially invite you for our CPD accredited webinar um, by Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists uh, um, in partnership with our sister Critical Care Society of Kenya and a very welcome, welcome partner who have worked with us, um, Alchem Lab Laboratories, um, who are uh, today represented by Mr. Nikilesh, and he'll address us a bit later in this session. So we will have two speakers today and we want to, it's gonna be a tight schedule. I won't take too much time, but first off we'll have um, Dr. Salim Hassan Ali. He is a pulmonologist and intensivist from the Aga Khan University Hospital, Nairobi. Uh, quite a bit of experience in critical care. I know I was taught by him. Uh, and I'm, we are really looking forward to his talk, which is um, optimization of antimicrobials in ICU based on pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics. Um, welcome, Dr. Hassan Ali. I think you will be able to share your slides now that the, um, we will ask the host to put down hers. Thank you very much for your kind ones, Angela. I appreciate it. And thank you for Alchem organizing this. Uh, I'm still disabled by the participant screen. My apologies, Dr. Hassan Ali. We are just trying to troubleshoot that. I think you can carry on. All right, uh, good, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, and thank you very much for your kind words, Angela. Though I don't deserve them at all, you know. Uh, and I, I would like to thank the Alchem uh, uh, for partnering this. So mine is, uh, I think this is just a review from, uh, from my experience base, having worked in South Africa on, to provide a foundation because dosing optimization requires a good knowledge of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic principles for various antibiotics. And I'm just going to give you an overview so that wherever you are in the ICUs that you manage, it'll help you because this has helped me in, as an intensivist to work with both uh, for my own patients as well as for the private consultants that I co-manage patients here with. So without much ado, as you can see that early and effective therapy, I, 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 can, I, can, I wish I can bring this screen down. Okay, I'm gonna hide that. Is, a, of, is an appropriate antibiotic therapy is a, is a significant det determinant of clinical outcomes. Dosing and timing of antibiotics is also very important component as choosing the right one. And we, as you can, as we know from the famous study of Anand Kumar's, uh, that in patients with septic shock, every hour delay in patients who are given antibiotics, there was a 7.6% increase in mortality. So timing is of essence, even as pulmonologists, if you talk to some of my pulmonologists, to all my pulmonologists will assess to that, that we should try and give as early as, as early as four to even eight hours the antibiotics. The aim of appropriate antibiotic treatment, and this is important, to maximize the rate and extent of bacterial cleaning, because that's what you want once you have a patient with sepsis. Reduce drug resistance, reduce drug toxicity, that's our aim. However, inappropriate antibiotic therapy is also associated with poor outcome. Number one, it can be a wrong antibiotic. Number two, you, people are using a narrow spectrum antibiotic. The third, which is the most important, which I feel that, you know, which I, through my experience, is that we are giving sub-therapeutic dosing, especially in critically ill patients. And I will defend my statement through some of the slides that I've, I have here with me. Number four, four is wrong diagnosis. And the wrong antibiotic, and the fifth one, is the wrong antibiotic based on the site of infection. Because remember, there are certain sites have poor penetration, certain sites, the antibiotics don't work. For example, if you have a respiratory infection, you cannot give antibiotics like deptomycin there because it will be <coughs> neutralized by the surfactant within the chest infection, within the respiratory tract. So one should be cognizant of those facts. So this is the main essence of my talk is subtherapeutic antibiotic because my main aim will be to look looking at using high dose antibiotic therapy especially in critically ill patients and i will defend with with the with the trials that i have attached here with all right 
So suboptimal dosing, as you all know, or subtherapeutic dosing leads to poor clinical outcomes poor clinical cure rates, increased mortality, and increased res incidence of resistant bugs or superbugs. And we have seen that. We're already seeing that with regards to the PDR and MDR organisms that we see in in or intensive care. Dosing based on PKPD principles of various antibiotics achieves maximum antibiotic activity. And this is confirmed and is, is proven. So what is P pharmacokinetics? And for those who don't know, just what I say is simple word. Simply is what the body does to the drug. So the body will absorb the, uh, the drug, distribute, metabolize, and ultimately eliminate the drug. Pharmacodynamics is basically what the drug does to the body, basically we survey with regards to the, the bacterial killing and all that. And then you have this PKPD index, which is a relationship between the dose administered and the rate and extent of bacterial killing. <clears throat> Pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic principles describes the fundamental processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, as I've already alluded to earlier, resulting in concentration with a time profile of an agent administered in vivo. Remember that we have time-dependent antibiotics and concentration-dependent antibiotics. And this is we'll allude to, to the graph that I have in the, later on in my slides. Pharmacokinetic studies describes the parameters such as peak concentration and the cumulative exposure maximum, that is the area under the concentration time curve for a given time period. And by applying the pharmacokinetic principles, a clinician can determine whether an appropriate dosing of an antimicrobial agent will reach the pathogens or not. We also must remember that the physical chemical therapies the properties of the antimicrobial is also very important. That is basically the relative solubility of the antimicrobial agent has, which has a significant impact, impact on volume of distribution. And this is very, very important, the volume of distribution. And we will talk to you about it later. And this will affect the selection of agents, number one. Doses expected to attain adequate penetration to the site of infection. And this will also allow you to understand that why high dose is necessary in critically ill patients. Certain anatomic compartments like bone, for example, CSF, lungs are penetrated poorly by some of the antibiotics. And so one I've alluded to is the <coughs> deptomycin. Most antibiotics, remember, have a poor bone to serum ratio. Whatever MICs or whatever drug therapeutic levels that we are looking at, are in the serum or the plasma. We do not have the tissues. Remember, we have tissue infections also. So if you look at, for example, for vancomycin, it is estimated the bone serum ratio, if you've got osteomyelitis, a staph aureus osteomyelitis, your bone ratio, bone serum ratio of vancomycin is only 0 0.2. So it's very poorly, it poor, penetrates very, very poorly in, in the bone. Fluoroquinolones, as you all know, we also know that the, two, the other category or classification of antibiotics is hydrophilic and lipophilic antibiotics. Fluoroquinolones is one of the high, lipophilic antibiotics, and it has usually have a, they usually have a very high volume of dif distribution. And that's why if you look at patients with bone infections and all, one should ideally use fluoroquinolones in such cases rather than using vancomycin glycopeptide agents. So the question is, which antibiotic and what dose? And that's very, very important because that's the question that everybody asks. We do not use standard antibiotics as has been shown in, uh, previously that you know, most of the standard antibiotics are being used. So number one, one should know what, what, which antibiotic are you going to use. So when you use it the, to differentiate what is a lipophilic or a hydrophilic antibiotic, in general, <coughs> hydrophilic antibiotics, they in general, a high volume of distribution implies the drug has to be distributed extensively to the tissues. And because lipophilic antibiotics have a high volume of distribution, they would be the ideal drug to use, especially in tissue when patients have a, where they have a very high volume of distribution. Whereas a low volume of distribution is basically relating to hydrophilic antibiotics, your beta-lactam antibiotics, for example. So in, critical, in critically ill patients, there's a very high volume of distribution. And because hydrophilic antibiotics require a use of loading doses, and it is very, very important that you must, must, any patient who comes with sepsis or septic shock, we have now gone away from SERS, sepsis, and severe sepsis. Remember, we only have the definition of sepsis and septic shock now. Is that they require loading doses to ensure early achievement of your <coughs> therapeutic consideration. That is, you want to achieve your steady state above the MIC very fast, as opposed to three or four, 
half-lives for you to achieve that steady stage by giving a standard dosing. That is eight hours early or whatever time, depend, uh, depending on the antibiotics that you use. So lipophilic antibiotics not, are not greatly influenced by the changes in fluid volume. So may, you may not really require the alteration in the initial dosing. And that's the reason why most of the antibiotics, if you see most fluoroquinolones, you can use moxiflox at 400. However, ciprofloxacillin, ideally in the intensive care setting, is supposed to be 400 TBS, not BD dosing, as was previously the norm. <coughs> So critically ill patients have lowered protein concentration and thus altered protein binding. And we know most of the drugs are protein bound, remember. They also have a very unpredictable volume of distribution. Why? Because we are, when the patients come with severe sepsis or septic shock, we are just pumping them with so much of fluid, they're vasodilated, so the volume of distribution is extremely, extremely high. And they also have vastly altered clearance compared to non-critically ill patients, which what I'm alluding to is the augmented renal clearance and that I'll allude to later on. So, as you all know, anti antibiotic dosing is affected by volume of distribution, which I've already talked about. So in, in patients with uh, sepsis, you have vasodilatation, and they have been given aggressive fluid re uh, resuscitation. They also have an increased creatinine clearance, especially those patients who, have not, who do not have acute kidney injury at that point in time, and they're or for the, for, for, to put it in, in simple terms, they do not have organ dysfunction at that point in time, all right? And even if they do, you have to give them <coughs> high, and we'll see that. And it is, this is very, very important with regards to your hydrophilic antibiotic, especially uh, your beta-lactam antibiotics. So albumin concentration is very, very important. As you know, in patients with septic shock or sepsis, albumin is a negative phase reactant. So invariably, you have a very low albumin levels. And as I've already talked about, that albumin is, most of the antibiotics are protein bound. So once you have low albumin, you have an increased free drug concentration. And if you have a normal creatine clearance, so for that better augmented renal clearance, uh, augmented renal clearance, what will happen is that this free drug concentration will be just washed away from the kidney. So they'll be eliminated via the kidney. So you won't have effective antibiotic concentration in, your, uh, in, in one's uh, uh, serum or plasma. So they also have augmented renal clearance. And the criteria of all the augmented, if you look at different criteria, and this has been shown that in patients, when they are giving in patients who are, because remember, septic shock is a warm shock. It's a distributive shock. So in these patients, your cardiac output is even higher than normal. Your cardiac index is higher than normal. So basically, you have increased perfusion to the Kidneys, so you have hyper because of the hyperdynamic hyperdynamic uh, circulation, you have increased augmented renal. And the augmented renal criteria they use is either some books will say 150 mils per minute, or some will say 130. So it depends what criteria you use to to define augmented renal clearance. So if you have a patient who comes with septic shock or sepsis, and with normal kidney functions, one should definitely calculate. And remember, Cockcroft Gold is not an ideal. Uh, it tends to <coughs> have a lot of uh, false positive, uh, false negative results. So it tends to underestimate many a time. So the ideal would be to do an MDRD if you have that, but it's also quite tedious. But now with this calculators that you have, it's very easy to, <coughs> to do that. And this is just to explain why they have augmented. This is by Uday and R. et al. It's a very nice paper by in clinical pharmacokinetics. In the, for, in the year 2010. And you can see these are, if you look at the SERS report, because they, at that time it was SERS, we, don't have, we didn't have sepsis. And what, what it just shows you that they are vasodilated, at the same time you have an increased cardiac output. What happens is that you have increased renal blood perfusion, your GFR increases, therefore you have augmented renal clearance. You also have renal reserve. Remember patients with acute kidney injury also have the renal reserve. It doesn't mean that patients who do recover from acute kidney injury, they tend to lose this renal reserve. And then you're also giving them vasoactive medications, be it, for example, in patients with septic shock, that tends to increase your cardiac output. You're also giving them IV fluids, that also increases your, <coughs> your uh, GFR via, via the above mechanism. So that explains the understanding of augmented renal clearance. And that's the reason why very high dose is also required of antibiotics. Remember, the other principle of pharmacokinetics is elimination. Kidneys can excrete antimicrobials and the metabolites via GFR or by proximal tubular secretion. And this is, and 
Also, the secretion or the elimination also depends on the molecular size of antibiotics in terms of renal replacement therapy. So you must decide which one would be ideal, whether you want to do an, a, a SLED or an intermittent hemodialysis or a continuous renal replacement therapy. What I personally feel that in my patients who have got septic shock, I would rather put the patients on, uh, on a CRRT because there you do not have to adjust or randomly adjust your antibiotics. Remember, these are patients with septic shock. The primary problem is sepsis that has caused the other multi-organ dysfunctions. Antimicrobial pharmacodynamics basically is a relationship between the antimicrobial concentration and observed effect and on the, on the target <coughs> pathogen in the body. And the best indicator for this is your MIC, the minimal inhibitory concentration. Unfortunately, in my unit, I've tried getting the MICs done and be given, and I've not been able to, and I'm not, I'm not successful. And that is the reason why, all the more reason why you need to give a higher dose of antibiotic. And I'll, I'll defend my, my statement. So these are the PKPED indices. Just to quickly go through, FT or MIC is, it looks at your beta lactam antibiotics, basically. It, it looks at your cephalosporins and your carbapenems. So that is the, bound, the time that the unbound drug concentration, which is the F in brackets, in the plasma that remains above the MIC of the infective organism. And that ideally, that unbound concentration has to be up at least four times above the MIC. The Cmax is the maximum concentration of blood uh, antibiotic can achieve over the MIC. This is alluding to your aminoglycosides. So you should have at least eight to 10 times the drug. So if you say, for example, if you have an MIC of 50, your drug concentration has to be at least 400 to 500 uh, the, the, uh, above the MIC for you to have an, an effective M, uh, F, uh, uh, CMAX to MIC ratio. The other one, then this is a concentration dependent uh, antibiotic. The area under the concentration curve to MIC ratio mm -hmm. is also used for other concentration dependent antibiotics. For example, vancomycin. Ideally, it's a very tedious process because you have to measure your 24 hours of, your, uh, of the concentration of the drug in the urine and all. And it's a very tedious process. But ideally for vancomycin, it should be above 400. They have even done, the recent studies, they have not even looked at for glycoside. Looking at maximum concentration to MIC, they have actually used your area under the curve to MIC ratios. And what they've said, and this is a study which was done in Italy, and what they've said is, is that if you have uh, uh, an area under the curve, especially in the critical Ill, uh, uh, units, it should be 80 to 100 times. If it's in the ward, you should it's it, you, sh you are good enough to use your uh, PKPD index of 50, 30 to 50. For example, for your fluoroquinolones, your area under the gout MIC ratio, you should you ideally should get away with 125, but you should it's it's better to get it above 250. All right. So these are some of the AUs, uh, the area under the gout MIC ratio, and this <coughs> graph actually alludes to what I've already. Uh, I don't know if you can see my area arrow. So this is the concentration, and this is the time, and this is the drug you give from time zero, and the drug will actually reach a peak, following which it will start coming down. MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration, and the time above the MIC to MIC ratio, your time of the unbound drug to MIC ratio is, your, is alluding to your beta lactam, your carbapenems, and cephalosporins. For your time above the MIC, for, for your FT over, over the MIC, for cephalosporins, it has to be supposed to be 60 to 70% of the time above the MIC. For penicillins, it has to be supposed to be 50% above the time. And for carbapenems, it's supposed to be 40% above the time for you to achieve bacteriostatic effect, a bactericidal effect. If it's a bacteriostatic effect, you want to achieve the same thing. For cephalosporins, it has to be 40%. For uh, uh, for penicillin, it has to be thirty percent, and for carbapenem, it has to be twenty percent. So I am with the school of thoughts for, with uh, of the intensivists that why not achieve hundred percent of the time? Why should I try and only give forty percent of the time? Because then my question, the question of antibiotic resistance, is not there because I have now achieved hundred percent of my time where the, the the drug is above the MIC. All right, so that's where my I'm one of the intensivists who follows that protocol but you can still get away with the low dose and as long as it achieves 
forty percent of the MIC about the time, forty uh, percent of the time about the MIC. But unfortunately, we do not get our MICs in our hospitals, so that's a, a, a caveat for us. The other thing which is very very important, and this is very effective, uh, important with regards to quinolones and especially carbapenem. They have what is known as a post antibiotic effect, especially carbapenems because they inhibit your the nuclei of the bacteria. The bacteria takes time to double, unlike the other antibiotics whereby they inhibit the protein synthesis and all. And one of the things that they've also looked, seen is that in patients, when they're given carbapenems, they actually end up having a post-antibiotic effect. So if you give a carbapenem for five days, that effect of the antibiotic may even last longer. However, nobody knows for how long, but it, there, it has been proven that it does, they do have that. So because of the alteration of the protein and the nucleic acids and uh, synthesis, the, uh, the, the organisms take time to multiply. So time versus time dependent versus concentration dependent antibiotic. Which one would you choose? So like I said, I've already talked about the cephalosporins, penicillin, I've not alluded to much. I think you know that the pharmacodynamic effects of pathogens are affected by the cumulative percentage of time of the free drug concentration that exceeds the MIC. And for cephalosporins, it's supposed to be 60 to 70%. Penicillin is supposed to be 50% above the MIC and carbapenems 40% for bactericidal effect. If it's a bacterial study, again, I allude to it's 40, 30, and 20, respectively. So this is an important uh, study which was done, and they looked at prolonged infusion versus intermittent infusion. And now there's also a study which has just come out last year, six months ago, looking at continuous infusion. Most antibiotics are stable for at least 24 hours at room temperature. And thus can be administered at 24-hour infusion. Carbapenem had an issue because they were not stable for three hours, but there's actually a study which has just come out a few months ago and they looked at continuous infusions, all right? And the, some of the newest kef kefalosporins, actually your ceftarolin and ceftobiprol, these are the fifth generation kefalosporin. Unfortunately, we do not have, they're not stable at room temperature for full 24 hours. That's the reason why when you're giving a prolonged infusion for say, for example, meropenem or doripenem, remember that you can give as an infusion over three to four hours. Imipenem, same infusion, the normal intermittent dosing is usually half an hour to an hour. But I normally, in my practice, if I'm giving meropen, and this is what I normally use because imipenem has, uh, I have issues with imipenem with regards to increased seizure rates with imipenem, and I've seen that. But with meropen, I haven't seen with very even with very high doses, and also with doripen, I haven't seen that. So your PKP day target for area under the curve of OMIC for vancomycin. Now this is vancomycin. Ideally, it should be 400, but you can use as trough levels as a surrogate. 20 would be ideal. Ideal, but also it also depends when should you use vancomycin. If you do not know your MIC, then it becomes very very difficult. If you're using an MIC, then you target your trough level of 15. Ideally, you can even go up to 20 now. And if your MIC is more than two, then you must look for an alternative oh. antibiotic. Be it you know linezolid or tacoplanin or some of the other new year generation kefalo fifth generation kefalosporin if it's a gram positive organism or mrsa that you're dealing with and clinic the only other caveat is that there's an, a lot of studies which have come out Kef, vancomycin was used as intermittent dosing <clears throat> remember i told you it's a concentration dependent depend antibiotic also at times depending on the dose it can become a time dependent there's a study which was done and they found that that continuous infusion of 18 to 20 hours of the drug because you have to uh, have give time for for you to measure your trough levels has less nephrogenic uh, nephrotoxic effect so <clears throat> i have used continuous infusions as opposed to a bd dosing or a tds dosing for vancomycin linezolid it's a brilliant drug the only thing that you must remember that it has got a lot of side effects it's got reversible thrombocytopenia it can got peripheral uh, uh, neuropathy but it's a beautiful drug because you don't need to randomly adjust your do dose. Fluoroquinolones, they have a very low concentration, peak concentration. They have low pro lower protein binding, but they've got a high tissue intake. Ideally, your AUC or MIC ratio should be more than 250, ideally. 125 will do if you do. Uh, aminoglycosides are rapidly bactericidal. Concentration dependent, again, eight to 10 times above the MIC, or you can use the AUC over MIC ratios. If it's 80 to 100 for critically ill patients, 
or 30 to 50 in the wards, depending on your PKDPD. So this is just the latest guidelines that I'm giving you. I'm sorry, I've not uh, given you the, the uh, reference for the latest guidelines. I should have put it. Polymixin, this is a very nice article which came out early in February 2019. And I urge everybody who's managing patients with uh, be it your polymixin E or B to read that article because it, it's written by experts and they give you a good recommendation. It is an agent of choice. So if you're using polymixin, then ideally, if you've got systemic infection, please do not use colistin. Use polymixin B because it's the best drug. You, can, don't have, you don't have to randomly adjust your dose, even, even if the patient is undergoing a sled or <coughs> uh, hemodialysis. Colistin, as you know, is very good for lower urinary tract infections, given the renal clearance of the pro, because it's a prodrug and it has to be converted to its active moiety. Uh, in the urinary tract. So it's ideal if you want to use cholestine, then use for lower urinary tract sepsis. But for systemic invasive infection, use uh, use uh, polymyxin B and with good outcomes. So polymyxin, you can give 25,000 uh, international units as a loading dose per kg, then 25,000 international units per kg divided dose is 12 hourly. Cholestine, what we, I have practiced, I have given uh, 12 mega units start and then 3 mega units TDS or 4.5 mega units BD. So whichever you use, that's. But if you look at the other guidelines, some of them will say you give a loading dose of 9 mega units and then 3 mega units TDS or 4.5 mega units BD, <coughs> whichever is appropriate. And this is the in the same article that I'm quoting. They've given you that what you, whatever your creatine clearance, that's mm. the dose of colistin one should give. All right. So the question, the other question is monotherapy versus combination therapy. And there was a lot of hype, especially when you, with regards to MDR organism, your, especially your non-lactose fermenting organism, your, for example, Pseudomonas or your Ebomani, whereby, you know, there is a debate that one should, whether one should give, if you look at this uh, combination or, so there was an article which came out last year and they looked at Ebomani and they said, if your ICU has got MDR organism more than 10 to 11%, then combination therapy is ideal. If it's pseudomonas infection, Ebomani infection, then combination therapy. The studies which have been done, and you'll, uh, you'll see that there was, yes, there was no mortality benefit, but there was, there was clinical and microbiological cure rates. So one should be, I normally, if it's an MDR organism, I prefer using combination therapy. Even if you have got a patient who's got drug resistance to meropenem, depending on your MIC, you can even have an MIC of eight. Ideally, uh, MIC of two would be ideal for all susceptible uh, anti, uh, uh, and, uh, or antibiotics. But if, it's, if your MIC is eight, you can even still use a, a, a polymyxin with meropenem in a higher doses, all right? So the increment study, and this is the studies which were done, which actually showed that you know, patients with bloodstream infections uh, due to uh, carbapenem as uh, resistant enterobacteriaceae, suggests that true benefit of combination might be limited to patients with greater severity of illness. And it's true. If you look at the IDA, tri IDA trial, which came out last year, and there was a lot of hype, oh, you know, combination was not. But if you look at that, the limitations were, sorry about the limitations of my, <laughs> for the spelling mistake. It was in number one, an open level. There are a larger number of patients were treated for pneumonia. And those patients actually had low SOFA scores. And that's why monotherapy was successful in that. And that's why they found that there was no difference in combination or uh, uh, monotherapy. So one has to be very, very careful. But I think it's better to use combination therapy, especially in a, in, 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 in a critical care unit where you're dealing with uh, multi-drug multi resistant organisms. What about the role of loading dose? And this I've already alluded to earlier. It's very, very important. Number one, remember that bacteria that does not get killed is a, is a collection for resistant by by via mutations. Prescribing the most apt, uh, active doses, and that's the reason why a loading dose is because you need to prescribe the most active agent at optimal dosing. So when you're giving an optimal dosing, irrespective of whether you've got acute kidney injury or liver function, you must, you must, I urge you that you must give a loading dose, the standard loading dose. You don't have to randomly adjust those. In fact, even studies have come out now, and even when I went for the, uh, the European Society of In uh, Infectious Disease Microbi uh, Clinical Microbiology, they actually are now using full dose uh, antibiotics and not randomly adjusting the dose 
for the first 48 hours in patients with acute kidney injury. Yeah. And I, we have done that. I've got five patients where we have used that, all right? So what about the dosing in ob obese patients? You have, because remember that obese patients have a very high volume of distribution and they also have an increased creatinine clearance. And you have to calculate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the either the lean body weight or the actual body weight. So what we normally do is for fluoroquinolones, you need, a, you need to do an adjust body weight. But for beta lactams, you need to do a beta uh, lean body weight. And for glycopeptides like uh, vancomycin, you do the total body weight. And it's very, very important, whichever you use. So the question would be, if you're using the ideal body, this is what we normally use. For adjusted body weight for a patient who is obese, and this is the formula that one can use. Ideal body weight, whatever is ideal body weight should be, 0 0.4 times minus the ideal actual body weight minus this ideal body weight. And you can get, and you can adjust your antibiotic drug dosing accordingly. So when you, what are the most important, which I think is important when you're prescribing an antibiotic? What is your target site of penetration? It's very, very important. Remember, in vitro sensitivity does not translate or equate to in vivo sensitivity. And we have seen that, in, especially with salmonella infection. We have seen patients that have grown salmonella. They've been given, they've been sensitive to ceftriaxone. Three, four days down the line, CRP is rising. They're still febrile. And we have had to change antibiotics. And we have got two cases, actually, to confirm the, the same. So remember that in vitro does not equate to in vivo. Most of the time, it does. Remember the other thing is tigacycline and anacondocandines are not useful for urinary tract infection because they've got a very poor concentration in the uh, uh, genitourinary system. Like I already alluded to, deptomycin is not useful for pneumonia because of the surfactant inactivation in, of the antibiotic. Clearance is very, very important. I've already alluded to this, so I won't go much. Remember that in patients with decreased cranial uh, clear, have a decreased clearance of hydrophilic antibiotics in acute kidney injury. They also have decreased clearance of lipophilic antibiotics in hepatic dysfunction. So you have to, in patients who have got hepatic defect, especially when you're giving quinolones, you should be very, very careful. What about patients with acute, acute kidney injury? And this is what, there's a recent paper which actually came out and they've actually, and this actually is being practiced currently by most intensivists all over the world, even in Europe and in the States. What they do is in a patient who comes with sepsis, septic shock or sepsis with acute kidney injury, they give a loading dose and they give a full normal dosing or high dosing to these patients for the first 48 hours. And I can attest to you that I have patients that I've given with creatinines of 300 and above. And over time, I've seen the creatinine go down with normal dosing. So don't be scared to randomly adjust your dose. And the other thing is, if a patients are on CRRT, you need to normally dose your antibiotic. You do not need to change. So if you're giving, say, for example, tesopipil, give 18 grams. You do not have to randomly adjust the dose. Or if you're giving carbapenems, give one gram TDS or two grams TDS, whatever. You don't have to randomly adjust those dose. Just the mere fact that they are on renal replacement therapy. And this is the, the uh, uh, a table that shows the dosing interval. If you look at tesopipil also, 18 grams. I know there was a lot of hype about the Marino study that it was useless, but that if you look at that study, there was a lot of variation in the MIC in community acquired MIs, mainly because of the Klebsiella and E. coli. And actually they found that, you know, that tesopipril and in our setup, the three drugs that we normally use, especially in the critical ill, the first and foremost we use is the tesopipril, second would be a carbapenem, and third would be cefepine. But you must Remember that if you're using cefepime, especially for abdominal sepsis, intra-abdominal sepsis, then cefepime does not cover your anaerobic organism. You have to add flagellin there, cotrimoxazole, all right? Fluconazole also, you need that to use a higher dose. You don't use the same dose. You can see it's, if you look at fluconazole, they're using 600 BD. In my setup, we used to use 400 BD. We don't use the normal dosing of 400 OD or 200 BD. So use of PCT to guide therapy. And this is what I normally use in my uh, intensive care unit. I advocate, I know my ID colleagues will think otherwise. They say there's no role. There's the pro rata study, which actually showed that when you use this, the uh, PCT guided therapy, there are few days of antibiotic therapy. Number two, there are lesser ICU stay days. So, and there's actually another uh, study which just came out six months ago, which actually confirms that the usefulness of PCT guided therapy and the CRP. So one should try and use that. And this is one of the trials that actually 
you, uh, uh, one of the st uh, study which was done in, this was a multi-center study and actually you could see that the mortality at 30 days was significantly lower with PCT guided therapy. Even with COPD patients now, one is using CRP guided therapy and it's showing better outcomes. Duration treatment, nobody will tell you. There's no hard and fast, view. but if you follow the Society of Critical Care guidelines, the, and if you're following PCT, as long as your PCT is less than 0 0.1, that's when you stop the antibiotic. But for, for patients on average is seven days, for pseudomonas, 10 to 14 days. There are studies which were done where they used for eight days and actually they found increased relapse rates in those patients. So you have to be very, very careful for how long you use. Number, remember, you must discontinue antibiotics if it's an uninfectious etiology or there is clinical resolution. So in summary, I know I've been a bit fast. PKPD fosters a rational and individualized dosing, remember. It also improves outcomes. It limits toxicity of antimicrobials. Loading dose and timing of the first dose is very, very important, especially the, the patients that we see in the casualty and whoever is seeing my patients, even with pneumonia, I always make sure that we give them a loading dose and we even start with the, sec the first dose of the regular dosing in the casualty before they go to the ward because it takes... The, the time it takes for the patient to go to the ward is very, very long. Target site penetration is very, very important. You must also look about the augmented renal clearance. Your volume of distribution is important. You must also know whether it's a time-dependent or a concentration-dependent antibiotic. Dosing should also be adjusted based on, your, on the patient's physical profile. If are they obese, then you must, renally, uh, uh, you must adjust your dose accordingly. Renal replacement technique is unique to ICUs. Remember that. De-escalation, you must de-escalate whenever possible. And you must convert to monotherapy or narrow spectrum once your culture re results are available. Remember patients, there was a very nice study which has come out and they actually looked at the, uh, the dosing of antibiotics. And I'll talk to you about So If you have a treatment failure, remember, it could be host factors because the patients are advanced stage, they immunosuppress, they've got chronic lung disease and they're uh, ventilatory dependent. Or it could be bacterial factors. Uh, these are actually drug resistant organisms you may be dealing with. Or patients have developed opportunistic pathogens on top of what you're treating. The other thing is therapeutic factors. These are inappropriate antibiotics. There may have been a delay in initiation of antibiotics. There may be insufficient duration of therapy. Or like I always say, suboptimal dosing. The last and most important is inadequate local concentration of the drug. Because remember, in vivo and in vit uh, vitro, uh, MIC's uh, uh, effects are different. Complications of the initial episode. And remember, if you are giving an appropriate antibiotic and the patient is not responding, then think about either the patient has developed an abscess or an empyema. That's the other thing that one should consider. Or you're thinking of other infectious sites that may be involved. Or it could be a non-infectious mimics. Those is, this is what normally is recommended. It is a very nice article in the current opinion in infectious disease. Of February 2020, I urge you to read on carbapenem dosing in uh, critical ill. And the, actually, the studies have even shown that carbapenem should be given higher. You may give supranormal dosing. And whatever dosing you're seeing, these are the ones which have been recommended that uh, uh, to be given. For piptazo, you give 4.5 and 18 grams. For ceftazidine, you give 2 grams start and 6 grams over an infusion of 24 hours. And this is a study which was in ICU intensive care medicine of last year. It's a very nice uh, narrative review of all the antibiotics. Again, you see your uh, tezopipril and all that. It's 18 grams. But for carbapenems, you can see 2 grams atavally IV. So it, and these are FDA approved, remember. It's not even uh, this thing. If you have your colleagues who are following FDA, or then this is all FDA approved. You see piptazo again. 4.5 grams every six hours. I normally give an infusion. I think infusion is much better with Piptezo. Pip and I know what the Marino study did was uh, discarded the, the, uh, the Tezopipril or Piptezo uh, effect, but I think it is a wonderful drug to use. And I normally use it as my first line before I go to carbapenems. These are gentamicin and amikacin. Amikacin, you need to ideally give 30 milligrams per kg every day. Remember, that's the ideal dose. So if you've got a patient with 70 kilos, then you need to give two grams. I feel, I see a lot of reluctance amongst my colleagues giving a 1.5 or 1.2 because they're always worried about nephrotoxicity. Don't be worried. Just give the dose because that's the appropriate dosing. If you're not, then it's sub-therapeutic. There's no point in giving the antibiotics. All right? 
I think I'll, I'll end here and thank you for your attention. If there's many questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Ali. Thank you so much. Wow, you've made a potentially big feast of a subject into nice bite-sized courses. Um, I think um, the audience will ask them to reserve their questions till the end, um, as is our culture. And I now I'd like to invite um, the cluster head of Alchem Laboratories Limited East Africa region, Mr. Nikilesh Srivastava. Um, welcome, Mr. Nikilesh. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Hassan Ali, for enriching ourselves you, with your fantastic talk yeah. on the relevant topic of optimization of antibacterial in ICU. Uh, my name is Niklesh. As just mentioned by the moderator, I work for Alchem Laboratories uh, based out of Nairobi. Uh, Alchem Laboratories is the fifth largest uh, pharmaceutical company from India. Uh, and having operations in more than 50 countries worldwide, including uh, US, Europe, Australia, Middle East, and Africa. And when you talk about Africa, primarily we are in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, our East African continent. As we all are, are talking about the very uh, common thing everywhere nowadays that we all are passing through a very unprecedented uh, scenario of COVID-19 pandemic globally. However, uh, being a scientifically promoted company, it is our uh, endeavor and responsibility to keep you all updated with the knowledge and information current which is related to your specialty. In fact, in the normal situation, we have been uh, meeting you personally to share these information, which is uh, not possible under the current scenario. And therefore, we at Alchem Laboratories have decided to join hands with the uh, KSA and uh, CCSK to organize this kind of webinar with a very relevant topic of uh, optimization of antimicrobial in ICU and uh, our own experience update with KU University. And in fact, I'm very thankful to the KSA and the CCSK office bearers to help us organize uh, such a knowledgeable webinar. And I'm also obliged to have Dr. Hassan Ali, who is a very popular uh, intensivist and pulpologist from Aga Khan Hospital here in Nairobi. And uh, thankful to Dr. Mary Mwangi, who is a consultant and astrologist from KUTRRH as our another speaker. Uh, since uh, time is short and I have been given uh, allocated 10 minutes, I just wish to present a few slides from our Alchem corporate point of view, which is the manufacturer of some of our very popular brands in Kenya and East Africa, like uh, you have seen Ondem, which is our Ondem Citron tablets and injections, and Pipzo, which is a Piperacillin and Tazobactam injections, 4.5 gram. And we also have uh, Pan-40 tablets and uh, Pan-40 injections. So let me just share with that. I hope uh, it is uh, visible to anybody. It's visible, thank you. Okay. So let me just do the uh, slide presentation. So as you can see, um, uh, again, from our side, uh, from being an Indian company, we call it Namaste, which is again uh, Karibu, what we talk in our language in Swahili here. <clears throat> so, in fact, Alchem Laboratories has been, this is a very uh, old uh, pharmaceutical company, which is established uh, way back in 1973, uh, headquartered in Mumbai, the commercial capital of India. This is ranked as the fifth largest pharmaceutical company in India. And we are present in uh, and not only in India, as I talked about, in many other key international markets. We have almost 16 manufacturing facilities across country and even we have in the US. And this uh, Alchem Labs is uh, listed on a um, stock exchange in India as uh, being a public limited company. Uh, these are uh, our uh, founders and uh, major global uh, operation team. Mr. Sampradha Singh, who is our uh, chairman, he is, uh, we, we just lost him last year. That is why we have mentioned it, Mr. B. N. Singh, uh, who is our uh, 
uh, executive chairman, Mr. Sandeep Singh, our managing director, and Mr. Gare, who is our president for international operations. So as I was talking about, uh, Alkim is the fifth uh, biggest pharmaceutical company in India, having uh, almost uh, 700 brands with 1,400 different SKUs. Uh, and since we're talking about antibiotics here, in fact, in India, uh, Alkem stands number one uh, company for the last 10 years uh, amongst the company dealing with anti-infective. We have almost uh, 15,000 employees working for Alkem across the globe. Uh, we have, uh, as I talked about, 16 manufacturing facilities. Uh, there are some pick of a couple of them, uh, which is uh, from uh, our plants. And as I informed, uh, out of that, 14, uh, 12 are uh, formulations, and the two are for APIs. And uh, as I was talking about, we also have uh, two uh, manufacturing plants, uh, which is uh, in the United States. And a couple of our factories are uh, highly accredited with the US FDA, MHRA UK, TG Australia, and MCC South Africa, a couple of uh, renowned uh, associations. So as you can see in this particular slide, uh, these are two St. Louis and uh, California. We have two plants, which is uh, in US and rest, all our plants are uh, uh, based in India, where we do our all manufacturing of all these products. As I was talking about, uh, we have, uh, mm, more than five, in our own research and development center, wherein we have uh, more than 500 scientists. Uh, those are working for it, uh, formulation development, API research, uh, regulatory affairs, and intellectual property cell management. Uh, as we're talking, we have filed uh, 100 plus ANDAs successfully in our uh, US market. And we also have our uh, CRO center, which is equipped with 112 beds for CLP and GCP compliant for BAB center, with in-house uh, analytical and statistical expertise, which is approved by US FTAs and TG Australia. Now we also have a subsidiary of Alchem Laboratories, which is uh, in India, called as Engine Biosciences Limited, wherein we primarily deal with only biosimilars and peptides. So very specialized uh, line which we are having here. So I'm coming specifically to our international operations. Uh, we have a global operations, as I told you, mentioned earlier, almost more than 50 countries worldwide. And one of the biggest, second largest market for us uh, after India is the US, which where we are having our corporate offer in the name of Ascend Laboratories LLC in uh, New Jersey, uh, which is there. Uh, we also have our uh, operations uh, in Australia, which is our third largest market after US, is uh, when we have a company called as Pharmacore, which is our subsidiary of Alchem Labs. It's an Australia-based company. We are also present in a majority of the European market, including UK, with uh, many uh, range of products. Besides these uh, other markets where we are present is our Southeast Asia market, Philippines and Kazakhstan in CIS, Middle East, and of course in uh, South America and Africa. In Africa, we have uh, across uh, market, including East Africa, where we have major market is Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. We are also in uh, French West Africa and Central Africa in Ivory Coast and other markets. In Kenya, in fact, uh, Alchem is a, um, a very popular uh, company as we have uh, completed almost 20 years of our operation in uh, uh, 2018 here. Uh, it means, that in fact, this is the first market for Alchem. We have, uh, as a company, we started our operations, uh, global operations. The first foothold was in Kenyan market. We have almost around 40 products across major uh, therapy 
and we market in uh, Pan uh, country, entire uh, country. All across, and our products are available in majority of the hospitals. A few of the brands which uh, I was talking about is uh, uh, popular brands of Alchem. I believe many of you uh, must have used it or must be using it. It's available in all major uh, hospital institutions like uh, Onden Cetron, mouth dissolving tablet, and we have injections. 408 milligram called as Ondem IV and Ondem MD tablets. We have Pipzo, which is our piperacillin and tezobactam 4.5 gram injections available across all uh, uh, institutions and hospitals. And um, Alchem is known in this country by uh, our uh, very uh, uh, famous brand called Pan. Uh, Pan is our pentaparazol. We have Pan 40 tablets and our lifelized. Uh, pan to injections also called as pan iv so these are the few brands beside this we also have a couple of more brands and clavam is another brand which is a very common brand uh, just to share with you this is my small team which i operate with the, in kenya these are my colleagues uh, from across kenya and while we have been celebrating our 20 year operation in kenya Thank you very much for uh, giving us time to um, share with you about uh, my company. And uh, thank you very much, KSA, again, for giving us opportunity to be a part of uh, this particular webinar. We wish to continue uh, working with you together closely. Asante Sana. Thank you, Mr. Nikilesh. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to, um, to partner with Alchem. And, um, we look forward to um, to working with you, and we thank you for especially for um, supporting this particular uh, knowledge exchange. Um, I'll, just because of time, I'll quickly move on to our next speaker. Um, as she sets up, this is Dr. Mary Mwangi, consultant anesthesiologist at the Kenyatta University Teaching Referral and Research Hospital, and she will be giving us. Uh, very, um, we have been waiting with bated breath, um, experience update um, on COVID-19. So Dr. Mwangi, the floor is yours. Hi, Angela. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides, Dr. Mwangi. Ah, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Dr. Mary Mwangi. Uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, let me say what we'd call a candid experience with uh, COVID-19 in KUTRRH. And this is an experience um, dated as per today. So I will be giving you statistics as per today. So, oops. Hmm. Uh, so, Currently in the hospital, we are having, or we from from the 24th of March to date, we've actually managed to admit 516 confirmed COVID positive cases, and uh, cumulatively we have had to discharge 17 of these COVID patients, uh, most of them on request, and. Um, about 149 have been discharged or meaning they have recovered, accounting for about 28% of uh, total admissions. Mortality wise, we have lost about eight patients in the two and a half months, uh, accounting for about 1.5% of all the patients uh, admitted. Currently, we have uh, 342 patients uh, confirmed COVID positive patients, meaning that we are almost full, if not full. Yeah, uh, th 342 patients. And of these 342, 14 of them are actually in our critical care unit. As per today, we've had six recoveries and uh, six of them have been discharged home as well. And we've had one new admission in the last 24 hours. And um, one of the suspected cases 
has actually turned positive. So for the suspected cases or as up to today, from the 24th of March, we had admitted about 149 uh, in total, and uh, 10 of them transferred on requests or to seek uh, other services. Then we have managed to discharge about 124. So the current patients in the ward who are suspected COVID-19 awaiting test results are about six. So the ones who are critically ill, um, just a moment, are about 3%, that is 14 of them. And these are the patients that were admitted to our ICU. The 97% were admitted in the isolation wards and they have been recuperating from there. Now, uh, when we focus on the critically ill patients in our, in our ICU, that is the age distribution. And you can see the most affected age group is uh, uh, patients between the ages of 51 to 60. And you have a few in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, when it comes to how many are female, how many are male, 64%, that's about nine of the 14 patients admitted to our ICU were male, and that six, uh, about five of them were female. Uh, in terms of comorbidities, what we noticed about the patients who were admitted to our critical care unit is that all of them had a comorbid a comorbidity. That is, they either had diabetes, hypertension, uh, kidney disease, COPD, HIV, TB, anemia, cancer, hepatitis, and ischemic heart disease. But as you can see from the trends, most of our patients had either hypertension or were HIV positive. Uh, that is actually uh, a radiograph of one of the patients we admitted uh, to our critical care unit presented with difficulty in breathing, cough, fever, general malaise, all that. And as you can see, he has a pneumon and we were actually him or not to intubate him, given the size of that pneumon. But after a lot of consultation and uh, cautious decision making, we decided just to put him on the land on high flow, and he was actually able to improve. That is another radiograph for another patient. Uh, this one was uh, HIV positive, also presented with difficulty in breathing. You can see the cardiomegaly, also a known hypertensive patient, and was intubated. This is a follow-up radiograph, and you can see the ground, ground glass appearance getting worse. The chest is really bad as we speak, so we have really instituted proning, we are doing proning for about 12 hours and she's actually improving. Uh, we intend to do a follow-up test radiograph uh, for this patient and monitor her progress. In terms of the signs and symptoms that this patient presented with, the most common symptom among all the patients in our critical care unit was difficulty in breathing, cough. Uh, they also complained about fatigue, uh, inability to feed and fever was also a symptom. We had a few cases that came in gasping and uh, these are some of the patients who are attributed to fatality. Um, patients who are mechanically ventilated, of the 14 cases we admitted to the critical care unit because they met our admission criteria, 79% of them required mechanical ventilation. However, 21% of them, uh, we were able to start non-rebreather mask high flow, high flows, and they were able to improve. So that accounts for about three of the patients, and 11 of the patients were, patients were actually mechanically ventilated. Uh, in terms of length of stay in a critical care unit, uh, among all the 14 patients we've had in the unit, uh, we are estimating that a patient who comes to a critical care unit with COVID-19, uh, they will stay for about eight days. 
before we start noticing recovery are good enough for us to discharge them to the ward. Give or take six, six days. Our outcome so far, um, unfortunately we've had 50% mortality, but uh, on the brighter side, we've had 29% uh, of our patients actually discharged the ward and then home. We have about 21%, that is about, uh, we have about three patients currently ongoing, uh, care is ongoing in the critical care. The 29% represents about four of our patients. You will ask why the high mortality? One is because most of these patients were received late. They had already started the cytokine storm. And some of them presented to us with multiple organ failure. And uh, some of them were actually in septic shock. So what is new? In KUTRRH, we were able to perform our first uh, caesarean section on a COVID positive mother. Actually, she was, uh, apart from high uh, blood pressure, that is, she had severe PET uh, on the boundary of getting health syndrome, she presented to us at 36 weeks. She was actually picked from the random testing that has been going on but she did not present with any signs of cough. She didn't have a cough, she didn't have a fever, she didn't have difficulty in breathing. So what did we do? We stabilized these patients over 72 hours. We stabilized our blood pressures and we gave dexamethasone because uh, the previous scan showed that the baby was about 32 weeks. So in case we needed to deliver, we needed to have been ready for this delivery. So we planned for the cesarean delivery because this patient was also a one previous car. And uh, as we were planning for the delivery, we had to plan for the neonates. So uh, we had to set up the COVID theater and we had to actually open up our NICU. We had to organize ourselves into teams. And when I talk about teams, we had the surgical team in theater and we had the ICU team. So we were working together and uh, because unfortunately by the time this patient came to our hospital, we did not have a resident obstetrician and neonatologist. We were able to talk to the Kenyatta National Hospital team. Uh, they gave us an obstetrician, Dr. Wende, thank you so much, and Dr. Irimo, the neonatologist. So they came and they were part of our team. When we were organizing for this caesarean section, as I said, we had to pre-assign a COVID theater. And we intend for this theater to handle all our COVID cases. May they be emergency cases or elective cases. We mapped out the whole pathway just to make sure we maintain, uh, we, we maintain infection control protocols so that we don't contaminate the corridors and the lifts. And then we formed the two teams, as I had said, all the teams were don't in full PPEs, and we had actually one nurse who was designated to control the traffic uh, from ICU to the OR and back to the intensive care unit. The patient, um, we made sure that the patient was stabilized in theater and uh, then transferred back to the ICU. In the event that we had done uh, uh, general anesthesia would have actually recovered this patient in the OR before moving this patient to ICU. The baby was taken to NICU thereafter, and uh, we tested this baby 24 hours after birth for COVID-19, the real-time PCR, and it turned out negative, and then we repeated the test in 48 hours. Then we had this dilemma to give the mother the baby or not to give the mother the baby. The mother was still testing positive. So we decided as a unit to have supervised visits so that the mother is able to bond with the baby while she was in full PPE. Uh, that's just a photo showing uh, how we don with our doning buddies, just to make sure that we are fully doned and we are protected. That is the team ready to go in to theater, fully doned. And that is our said mother, uh, as you can see, what I want you to note in this photo is that she was actually in an N95. She was actually in an N95. Yeah, then that's the theater team ready to receive the mother. As you can see, that's our OR. 
and the operation is going on. Those are the supervised visits that I was talking about. Um, in conclusion, I want to say this planning is key and we need to understand that COVID is here with us. It might be here with us for some time. So we need to plan. We need to consider all patients currently as exposed because of this pandemic. And we need to take the proper precautions and use our PPEs very well. We need to be ready for change and adapt quickly. You can see our numbers are going up. We don't know when they'll, we are going to surge and when the surge is going to stop. So we need to really plan for that. And we manage all our resources. We need to also have dedicated COVID theaters in our specific hospitals and form teams. When I talk of teams, I'm saying multidisciplinary teams. You need the physicians, you need the nephrologists, you need the pulmonologists, the, um, the, the pathologist needs to be on board. So it needs to be a very comprehensive team if you're to do anything. Uh, then we also need to support our hospitals in doing the non-COVID operations because uh, as we've said, COVID is here for a while. So for us as KUTRRH, what are our plans? Our plans are to continue supporting the two systems, COVID and non-COVID. So we are actually going on with our elective non-COVID operations. The only precautions we are taking, and it is what is in the protocol, we are making sure we are testing these patients before they come to theater. Someone will ask, what are the plans for the staff? Yes, we have been with COVID for now about six weeks. Uh, the plans for our staff, as we started this week, we are having mass testing of all staff. We have designated wards for the staff. And as I had previously mentioned in the previous webinar, uh, we are actually ensuring that our staff goes on, uh, they go on quarantine once they are through with their duties and they are tested before they work. We also encourage them to continue with uh, hand hygiene and personal protective measures as much as possible. The other thing, we're also catering for our staff treatment and we're also doing a lot of psychosocial support, debriefing, and a lot of counseling services. Message here is that we need to plan for any eventualities and uh, we are also trying to look into new treatments available. We are trying to write proposals so that we can see whether we can institute some of the new treatment guidelines that have been given to us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Angela. Thank you, Dr. Mwangi. Thank you for this. That, that is an excellent, excellent update. I know it's going to generate a whole uh, barrage of questions. So what we'll do is as people bring in their questions into the chat, we'll tackle them and the questions are all clearly directed to both you and Dr. Hassan Ali. Let me try and group them and just start from the beginning. Uh, we just have 20 minutes for this before we wrap up. So I'll just start. Someone's, someone's, I'll group two questions. Um, Dr. Hassan Ali, regarding dialysis, if you can hear. Um, yeah. Someone asked about like if in areas where there's no CRRT for various reasons, including economics, um, now considering normal dialysis, there's a question about amikacin dosing and I think just dosing in general um, for, with dialysis. Maybe I think you talk covered it, but if you could um, touch that again. So, so, so there, there was a very nice study which was done, especially in patients with septic shock. And this is just one study. So I can't say that you have to use this for every patient. Remember that even if you're using dialysis, then you, do, you give you an antibiotic because this is just the peak concentration of the amikacin that you're going to use. So you, you usually give it after the, your dialysis session, if need be, or two hours prior to it, because you want the maximum bactericidal kill because it's your Cmax to MIC ratio. Now, there's a study which was done uh, in, uh, in critical care. This was some few years ago, but it's just one study. And what they did was they gave a very high dose of amikacin in patients with septic or septic shock uh, of 70 milligrams per kg. And what they did was they gave a dose and immediately at two hours later, they dialyzed them. And that study showed that there was benefit in terms of mortality in this patient. So it's just one study. I can't say that one should use that, but you can, even if you're using intermittent dialysis, you can just give, because we are not giving, <coughs> being a, a concentration dependent antibiotic, we are not giving it as a continuous dose, like unlike the beta lactams or your cephalosporins or your, your penicillin drugs. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll mix up the questions to um, both the speakers. Let's go to Dr. Mwangi. There's a question about um, your experience with CPAP and BiPAP um, in COVID-19 patients. If someone is asking if you think it's effective, I'm not sure if you have any experience with that or, or any comment about that. Uh, unfortunately, for our critically ill patients, we've not been able to win them down to CPAP and BiPAP. As we stand, as it is right now, not yet. Okay, fair enough. Um, me and my experience, um, I have nothing to contribute there. So <laughs> I shall move over swiftly. Somebody else is asking. Um, hi, hi. Oh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm actually tuned in. Hi, everyone. Um, maybe I can help with that because we, we, we currently use a lot of CPAP and BiPAP for our patients. Yeah. Um, just, so just hold on. This is Dr. Maxine Okello. This is Dr. Maxine Okello. She's a renowned anesthesiologist who, is, who has a wealth, of, um, a wealth of experience with COVID-19 patients in critical care. Just yeah. So go ahead, Maxine. So from our unit, uh, what we have done is basically for patients who are unable to tolerate a non-rebreather uh, non mask, we escalate them to actually use CPAP. And what we've actually used as cutoff points is if we realize that FiO2 is going above 70% and despite um, high flow um, or a lot, uh, despite the high oxygen saturation, I mean the high flow of oxygen they're receiving and their PO2 levels are dropping and are getting below eight we actually now make a decision to intubate them uh, but then we also have a protocol where patients who have managed to be weaned off um, mechanical ventilation from from the COVID infection we don't put them back on CPAP or BiPAP but we have something called um, an OptiFlow but CPAP is also definitely an option worth considering I think um, it, it's not uh, um, in in the guidelines it was not you know really being pushed but in the hospital um a few consultants just had to make a decision and say we're going to use it anyway so uh the thing you have to consider is the amount of oxygen you have available in your unit and the amount of machines you have and how many patients you're willing to actually put on CPAP or BiPAP but it definitely helps. The patients definitely do not like it. You have to have a candid conversation with them because they get quite uncomfortable. And you can imagine asking someone to sleep prone while on a CPAP machine, but it's definitely possible. And it definitely works. Thanks, Maxina. I was wanted to ask, are there any like caveats? Uh, do you see a sort of a consistent response in a well-selected patient moving from NRM to CPAP? So the it's a very oh, tricky question, but I'm sorry. Uh, the thing is, we've noted most of the patients who end up going to CPAP or BiPAP don't end up getting intubated. So um, we've had the 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 you know the very tough strain, and and unfortunately, our mortality rates have been very high as well. So. Um, it's 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 never a good sign usually and and patients actually feel that because they've seen that some patients are on a breathing mask and and then they get to go home and then they've seen those patients who are on CPAP and BiPAP and then they are being told they're being transferred to ICU so even the general perception amongst patients is it's not a good sign that I'm going on to CPAP or BiPAP but the patients who've been on it um, actually feel slightly better in terms of improvement in their breathing despite the distress that they still have. Um, I think it's a temporary measure because the, the most challenging decision is telling a patient that you'll have to intubate them. And for us, what we've noted in our, in our unit is you have a 60% chance of mortality if we actually mechanically ventilate you. So um, it's, it's a very tough dis discussion, but it's usually, it's there that we have seen us, ourselves de-escalating from sleeper BiPAP back to just regular um, oxygen supplementation. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you for that. Thank you for your contribution. It's really well appreciated, even with the time difference. Um, I'll take, send a question to Dr. Hassan Ali. Uh, somebody's asking about procalcitonin, uh, which you would um, probably regularly use as a, a proxy to adequacy of um, response to antibiotic. And someone is asking when it's unavailable, what would you then use as a guide to 
the, the duration and, and adjustment of treatment. So, of course, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, you just use procalcitonin just for the sake of, you know, uh, uh, looking at, you have to look at the clinical response of the patient. You know, in terms of, sorry. Sorry, I just need to mute somebody. Okay, uh, so you look at the clinical response, you look at the, your, of course, your white cell count and all that, but many a times it can, it can be a, a, a confounder, especially in, in intensive care, you know, when they have got pain, they're on, on, on catecholamines and all that, your white cell, or on steroids for that matter, your white cell count may be high. CRP is the other option one can use as, as, an, as, as a surrogate, and we also use both in, in our setup if we can. Because many a times, if a patient, for example, has got uh, uh, in, uh, trauma, for the example, and if they're bleeding, then your CRP usually goes up, whereas your PCT may not. So that's one of the caveats that you can. But uh, it's, it's a tough uh, call. But these are surrogate markers. Remember, we don't have anything. So there's actually, if you look at the current, there's a very nice article which came out, and it's the septicite. Uh, they're saying it's a PCR-based uh, test which can actually make a diagnosis of sepsis. We don't have that. It's actually FDA approved. The turnaround time is six hours. And they look at four RNA transcripts uh, to confirm whether the patient has got sepsis or not. And it has actually been proven and is actually currently FDA approved, but we don't have it yet. I think we are uh, a while back before we can get it in, in this country. But that's one of the uh, 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 things that we can actually look forward to that at least we'll know whether this patient has got sepsis or not. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hassan Ali, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Mwangi, maybe I'll send just a simple question on your side. Um, what, what's the, la when, how, when, for the staff, when they get tested after they finish their duties, um, if it's a week or whatever their, their run of duties is, uh, when they're going to quarantine, when do you sort of do your, your screening or your first test afterwards? What's the lag time? from when they stop interacting with patients to when you do your test? And For us, we consider seven days after the last because we expect you to have shown signs or symptoms or to start viral shedding by day five post-exposure. So we, shall, we usually test the patients seven days post the last exposure. Then after that, uh, if within the seven days a staff gets to be symptomatic, they are, they are actually tested if they are symptomatic, despite of the seven days. If you show symptoms at day three, then you are now eligible to get the test. Then after that, if you get a positive test, it is usually repeated within 48 hours, just to make sure that um, you are a true positive. Yeah, so that's how we do it. You quarantine okay. seven days, then you're tested. Thank you, thank you. It's nice, it's nice, nice to know what the practice is for you, you all who are um, sort of in the thick of it all the time, and we see you smiling there. I can see your background. You don't look like you're in a very dingy quarantine at all. It looks very good. So, um, Dr. Hassan Ali, there's there's a question here that I'll try and break it down and synthesize it, and then perhaps the. Um, the, the individual who's asking Erasmus might take it up with you individually on a different forum. But for here, um, one, of the, one of the questions really is, is just about the evidence behind some of the concepts. Like, um, uh, for example, he's asking if, if we, we really do have, uh, how do you say? He says that if even cardiac output is raised um, mm -hmm. in this in septic patients, but um, is distributed, distributed away from uh, critical organs, basically. So it's just wondering about uh, sort of the notion that, that you have augmented renal clearance in septic shock. So, so I think just ask, yes, just what are your so, comments so, about uh, that? Uh, so uh, that's a good question, but remember that when you have cardi uh, increased cardiac output, your, your, if you look at the kidneys, 25% of the cardiac output goes to your kidneys. So, you know, the concept that you have there, and they've actually done studies on to look at your creatine clearance on these patients. Remember, what we are using is a, a modified form. They actually look at the creatinine levels, you know, you taking the urine and your serum creatinine levels. The question that you talked about, about deptomycin, I agree that, you know, the, the studies which were done with hematogenous pneumonias, but remember, 
there's an FDA warning with deptomycin and it can cause eosinophilic pneumonia. So I think once you try and be very cognizant of the fact that you look at the antibiotic and see what are the side effect profiles rather than say, look, we can use deptomycin. All I'm saying is it can be, it is de deactivated by the surfactant. And if you've got a patient with pneumonia, you don't know whether this patient has got hepat hematogenous pneumonia or not. You can't say everybody who comes with pneumonia is uh, hematogenous spread. So, and uh, the, the study which was he's quoting about was actually done in mice first. This was way back in 2005, if I can remember. But deptomycin can, <clears throat> one should avoid. You have other options in your armamentarium, especially with gram-positive infections. You have your fifth generation cephalosporins, you have your uh, uh, delphopristine, quinapristine combination, you've got your uh, telavancin, tacoplanin, for that matter, linezolid. So you have a lot of other drugs that you can use to, uh, for, 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 for infections with regards to respiratory tract uh, involvement. Yeah. Thank you. I think his, probably his last question was um, concerning um, GFR um, in, so and in the CRT, circumstance of CRT. So, so what CRT does is just takes your normal physiology, works like a normal kidney because it's using a s slow process. It sort of uses your, your normal GFR criteria. You know, it's using, it's sort of a surrogate for your, your kidneys while your kidneys recover or recuperate. And what they found out that giving low dose and many a times, remember some of these drugs are dialyzable, you know, your antibiotics like vancomycin and all are dialyzable. Aminoglycosides are dialyzable. So when you're giving these medications and you know, you'd rather give normal dosing, knowing surely well that, you know, because these patients are very septic, they have got, you've given them fluids to try and bring those pressures up. You, you know, your normal uh, body, uh, blood volume would be five liters. Now you're giving them two, three liters extra to try and get those pressures up. So you're basically increasing, increasing your volume of distribution. So what CRT has been shown, and it's actually been proven that most of the, uh, the nephrologists are now, I know as of, are using actually normal dosing. And they will actually tell you, please use normal dosing in patients with CRRT. So it's not that they're, because you're using CRRT, you're using your GFR to be 15. I think that's a misconception. It's sort of using as a surrogate for your normal kidneys. Absolutely, and understood. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Ali. Um, unless I'm not being very vigilant on the chat, I think, uh, I think I've covered most of the questions that are coming in. I think the presenters have done an excellent job. I'm not sure if they have any parting comments or from our or from our partners. Uh, we were due to run till seven o'clock. We are six minutes shy. I see one question coming in, and I'll sneak it in. Um, Dr. Wangi, this is for you. How frequent do you get a health worker testing COVID positive in your institution? What's the overall picture at KU? Right. So far, so good. Uh, we've not had uh, any of our health workers testing positive, the ones working with COVID positive patients. Uh, but now because we have started mass testing of all our staff, we may be having new data coming in our way. But I can actually confirm to you that in ICU, we've not had any of our staff testing COVID positive. And how frequently do we test them? Uh, in a month, they are exposed, say, twice, so probably they'll get tested once every month. That's how frequent we test them. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, Dr. Hassan Ali. So, Mary, great presentation. I, uh, you know, I've, I'm currently managing a patient and I've actually been using antioxidants. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, this would be to any of them uh, on the panel that uh, what is their... Uh, have they used antioxidants like vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C in these patients who are uh, relatively sick? And the other question is that if you look at the Society of Critical Care Guidelines, the use of steroids is there indicated in patients who are actually intubated in this severe COVID patients, COVID-19 patients. And uh, they have actually advocated the use of hydroxy, uh, sorry, hydrocortisone. So my Two questions would be to, uh, whether to use your, whether you've used or have got experience with, your, with the effects of antioxidants. And the second one was the use of steroids in, in patients that uh, are critically uh, COVID-19 positive or have COVID-19. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Asinari. Uh, well, actually, we've been using vitamin C specifically for all for, for most of our critically ill patients. And uh, we have noticed uh, a bit of improvement. And we have also been using steroids for the very critically ill patients. However, unfortunately, in the two patients we used uh, uh, the steroids, we were not, unfortunately, it ended up in mortality. That was like our last bullet. So mm -hmm. I cannot mm -hmm. really comment conclusively on uh, whether it's beneficial or not, but for vitamin C, yes. And it is also what we are using in most of our patients in the uh, infectious disease unit. Okay. okay. What about okay. vitamin D and uh, zinc and uh, niacin, uh, nicotinic acid? I have a patient who is actually a VVIP, and I've used this who came in and was very, very sick, actually. She, her saturations were 87%, and apparently uh, I have not had her to take her to ICU at the moment, and she's done extremely well on this. I don't know whether it was a normal proce recovery process or whether this antioxidants <laughs> helps. Uh, so I think that's a question that we'll, we'll only, we won't know, basically, so. Now, uh, we've not used the rest, but uh, now that you have mentioned it and you are reporting a positive outcome, I think it's something we should uh, really think about. So, and South, see whether... so, so South Africans have got a very nice protocol. What they're using yeah. is vitamin D of 60,000 units start. Okay. Drink 200 milligrams daily, vitamin C 500 right. TDS and nicotinic yes. acid, which is actually in your Pebrinex, which you got around okay. 100 BD. So you have got, actually Pebrinex has got 100, 160 milligrams. So you can actually okay. use that. The other question is use of uh, N-acetylcysteine because the studies were done initially with influenza and actually showed that uh, there was symptom improvement, no mortality benefit. And actually there's a yes. currently an ongoing study whereby they're actually using very, very high those of N-acetylcysteine, actually they're using six grams in this COVID-19 patients. Wow. So uh, I, I want to know your thought process on that or for anybody who's there. Oh, we might have to take that to a, <laughs> we'll have to leave that as a cliffhanger probably for today. Um, yeah, thank but you thank much. you. Thank you so much. That was very stimulating. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan Ali, for your time and for your presentation, Dr. Mwangi. Thank you for the experience and thank you for taking your time as well. And Alchem um, Laboratories, thank you for supporting this webinar and for your continued support. The audience at large, we thank you for logging in. Um, if there's anything that is left hanging, um, please, you can direct your questions um, through to the admin of anesthesia, um, Kenya Society of Anesthesiology, and we can, we can give you the contact of the speakers. And as well, we just know that uh, we'll be here again next week, same place, same time. Um, any feedback on any of, any of the talks you've had, anything to come um, is most welcome. Thank you and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.